you have lone atoms, well, you, you can do plenty of things with lone atoms, but if you fit atoms together, you can make more complicated structures. This could be ionic, in which case you generally end up with a crystalline structure, with repeated patterns, or it could be molecular, in which case, yeah, you still end up usually with repeated patterns because one molecule versus many molecules, uh, logistics wins. So mass production wins. It wins big. And also self-replication is kind of important for life. So, the strongest types of chemical bonds are covalent and ionic bonds. Now there are some ionic bonds that are stronger than some covalent bonds and vice versa. In biology though, because covalent bonds as are kind of important for assembling atoms into molecules or even into polyatomic ions, we generally focus more on the covalent bonds. And molecules, well, there's a reason molecular biology is a field. It's because molecules are just so important. So covalent bonds, suppose we have two hydrogen atoms. Hmm. Okay. Hydrogen and hydrogen. Let's say they have electrons. One each. All right. So this is, by the way, going to be roughly the spherical electron cloud, the probability distribution. And let's say they approach each other. Well, then suddenly the electron distribution starts looking more like two teardrops. So they're no longer spherical. And if these become attracted enough to the other nucleus and the alignment is correct and they aren't moving too fast, in which case they'll probably just pass by each other, you end up with the two electron clouds merging and it looks something like this. I mean, it still looks kind of blobby. Uh, mileage may vary on whether your textbook rendition will have it be dumbbell shaped or one big oval. So something like this. We draw, now draw this line here to designate that this is bonded or something like this. What essentially is happening here is that the electron slots into the other atom's orbital, whereas the other atom's electron also slots into this atom's orbital because, well, they can fit one more electron in their orbital. So this is called a sigma bond. It is directly between two atoms. This is a single bond. If you have a double or triple bond, then you have the dumbbell-like p orbitals to the side also bonding, and we call these pi bonds. Now let's say we have molecular oxygen. Okay, so let's just signify the sigma bond, which by the way is written like this. This is a lowercase sigma. The uppercase is this thing, and you might be familiar with that from math, where it's used for sums. This is sigma bond. So we use sigma and then dash bond. Okay, uh, this line, well, for structural diagrams, this designates a sigma bond. And we would just use a double line in a structural diagram, but for now we're going to show the actual pi bonds. Now, for this double bond, oxygen undergoes sp2 hybridization, which leaves two lone pairs for each as lobes. Uh, these stick into and out of the page or surface, whereas the p orbitals that remain unhybridized are like this, and they have lone electrons. Hmm. Well, these lone electrons are going to get attracted to the other nucleus, and then eventually these bonds are going to start overlapping. And this 
will form something that looks vaguely like this. Hmm. So, roughly this type of shape for the molecular orbital in question. Uh, they could have named this something like molar because it kind of looks like a tooth but we are already mo using molar or molarity for well amounts or concentrations in chemistry so no let's call this something else hmm i wonder what this symbol is well in math this is of course pi although usually we write the lower case which is like this and the uppercase is rather wider apart, actually. Uh, but, yeah, let's just call this a pi bond, okay, guys? So, uh, this bond will pull these atoms closer together. Okay. What happens if we add another one? I mean, closer together, because you, it takes energy to break this bond, that's going to be a stronger bond if you have two bonds, a sigma and a pi bond, compared to just one sigma bond. But what if we add another pi bond? Yes, it gets even stronger because, oh, it's another bond that you have to break if you want to bust these two atoms apart. But it doesn't get as much stronger as with your first pi bond. How could this be? Well, let's say we are forcing two nuclei to become closer together. Hmm. That's two positive charges. You see where this is going, right? Yeah, pushing two positive charges closer together is perhaps not the most brilliant idea known to man for not costing energy. In addition, the two pi bonds will tend to repel each other a little because after all they are negatively charged and orbitals do displace each other that's why this sort of hybridization even happens well, let's say we have a covalent bond and we want to draw an electron distribution diagram and this is going to look like a Venn diagram a little bit. The first orbitals are like this. The second electron shell or the valence shell looks like a Venn diagram. So they overlap a little. And we would draw it like this with four electrons being shared. And each one of these oxygens has four more electrons in the valence shell. Okay. The electrons that are bonding are shown where the orbitals overlap. What happens if we use a Lewis diagram instead, where we only have to draw the valence shell electrons, and we can use dots? That's why it's called a Lewis dot diagram a lot of the time. As you can tell, uh, it's pretty obvious why the Lewis dot diagram is a lot more popular than the electron distribution diagram. Well then, uh, what happens if we want to draw the structural formula? Well, that's even simpler, like this. Okay, uh, wait a second, guys. What if we want to still show the lone pairs? Because that can sometimes be important for chemical reactions. Well, you use a structural formula that also has the lone pairs indicated where relevant. You don't necessarily have to show all of them. But in this case, I went and did it anyway. So, what happens if we have a triple bond? Well, in a Lewis dot diagram, it's not obvious whether this is two rows or two columns. But it immediately becomes obvious when you're doing a triple bond that, yeah, it's going to be columns that designate, well, columns with respect to the bond axis. So perpendicular to the bond axis, that's going to be where your pairs are drawn. Let's say we want a space-filling model of covalent bonds. So we want the molecule to look bulky instead of marshmallows and toothpicks, as I'm sure you've 
probably played with in the past for modeling molecules. Either that or plasticine in toothpicks. They're very commonly used. So a space filling model uh, where the electron shells are made rather more solid than they actually are, they look like atoms mashed together. Now there's actually a bit of a problem with this space filling model in that if you had other metal atoms in there, uh, the carbon coloring well, gray is rarely used because gray is usually reserved for metals. But, well, black is typical for carbon. In this case, it wasn't used for whatever reason. Sometimes you see gray. But the hydrogen white, oxygen red, nitrogen blue convention is quite standard. Sulfur, well, that's usually a yellow, bright yellow. And uh, varying shades of green are common for the halogens. We refer to the covalent bonding capacity of an atom as its valence. As we can see up here, carbon has a valence of four. Sometimes you see three bonds, though, in this case, because here we have an aromatic ring. Now, we can discuss aromaticity and such more in, say, chemistry class. The covalent bonding capacity, or the valence, usually equals the number of electron pairs it can make with other atoms to complete its valence shell. Or the number of unpaired electrons to complete its valence shell. But then we have stuff like sulfate, i.e. the dehydrogenated version of sulfuric acid, or phosphates. Sulfuric so acid is H2SO4, so S is in the middle, it looks like this. How could this be? Well, this is because we can have sp3d2 hybridization, where sulfur has a lobe in every one of the usual six directions you think of, i.e. four directions on the horizontal plane and then up and down. So, what about phosphates? Well, phosphates are PO4 3 minus, and that's this. Minus, O oh, minus. And H3PO4 is phosphoric acid, in which case you hydrogenate each of these oxygens. Hmm, is hydrogenate the best term? Eh, not particularly, more like protonate, because you're not adding actual hydrogen atoms. You should be adding protons, so hydrogen nuclei. Now, protons, uh, H plus ions, actually don't exist as such in solution freely. They exist bonded to water or to something else that's giving them a coordinate bond, usually. So, electronegativity, uh, there's a reason why here we put all the negative charges on the oxygens, and that's not just because of phosphate is already at its bonding capacity, is also because oxygen is electronegative. It's very electronegative. Fluorine is rated at 4.0 electronegativity. Oxygen, which is the next one over on the periodic table, is rated at 3.5. Chlorine is actually only rated at 3.0. Nitrogen is rated also at 3.0. And carbon is rated at 2.5. Hydrogen is rated at 2.2 electronegativity. And the alkali metals have very low electronegativity. So hydrogen, when it's bonded to carbon, we consider that to be a nonpolar covalent bond because they have about the same affinity for electrons. Their electronegativity is similar. Generally, 
we define nonpolar covalent bonds as difference in electronegativity below 0 0.5, so the electrons are essentially equally shared. The polar covalent bonds, well, the electrons are not so equally shared. One atom tends to grab the electrons from the other one. Generally, we define this as between 0 0.5 and 1.7. However, hydrofluoric acid is actually a molecular compound, not ionic, which is rather an exception. Why is this? Well, it's actually because the fluorine anion would be so small that it's got a very high charge density. And because it has that high charge density, it's not very stable. The result is that HF is a molecular substance. Now, water and ammonia, they have polar covalent bonds because oxygen has electronegativity 3.5, nitrogen has 3.0, and hydrogen is only 2.2, so that's a pretty big difference. They are polar, uh, and they have a partial positive charge on each of the hydrogens. They are not symmetrical. This is important. Say you have boron trifluoride. Well, the boron is going to be deficient in electrons, but does it actually have an overall molecular dipole? Are the charges concentrated toward one side of the molecule? Well, in ammonia's case, uh, we can also draw ammonia as this. So this hydrogen is towards the back, and we have one coming out the front. And what else? Hmm, we have one coming out the side, right? Well, actually, it's at an angle because this lone pair displaces all the other bonds downward. So, like this, lone pair is up here. And, well, these three are all positively charged and they're all on one side and the nitrogen is partially negatively charged and it's on the other side, therefore you have a dipole. Lower case delta is what we use. Uh, you may superscript the positives and negatives, or you might just write them like this. It depends on the convention. Okay. Usually, for space filling diagrams, we use red for partial negative charges. This is because oxygen is conventionally shown as red, but conventions may vary, so just be kind of careful and pay attention to the actual molecules and the atoms involved, if you can. Ionic bonds, well, it's not actually the case that you go molecular bond, molecular bond, molecular bond, polar molecular, polar molecular, suddenly ionic character shows up. No, there's a relatively smooth gradient. Ionic bonds generally have difference of electronegativity, or delta En, over 1.7, but there is exceptions. So if the difference is large enough, then it's essentially one atom ripping an electron off of another. Let's draw a Lewis diagram of NaCl. NaCl. Okay, so remember the half arrow is generally used for single electron movements. Uh, what happens next? Well, we get Na plus and then Cl with a full octet. Minus, and they are shown close together to show that they are bonded. Hey, what happens if we need to draw multiple cations or multiple anions? Well, we draw them around the other one. 
Notice that these square brackets are used when you actually have valence electrons to show. Sure, sodium still has a full 8 in its outer shell. After it loses this one, it changes to a new valence shell. But in a Lewis dot diagram, we usually don't actually show that. We just show its new status with one less in its original valence shell. Otherwise, this is pretty easy to get confused in terms of, well, we started off with eight electrons total in the valence shells, and now we have 16. Something tells me keeping track of the electrons in those case circumstances would be, um, well, it's a little bit easier to make mistakes. So try not to do this. That's why the convention has us show emptied out original valence shells as well empty. So these square brackets are to prevent us from thinking that these electrons belong to some other atom or polyatomic ion or molecule. Now we call ionic compounds salts in general because common table salt and many things that tasted kind of salty to ancient people they were all called salts and then people found out that they were almost all ionic or all were ionic all the ones they knew of and went well we might as well just call these things salts still uh, whatever it's like water yeah um just because we know that it's dihydrogen monoxide do we actually have to call it that all the time hey How's the dihydrogen monoxide tap going? Something tells me that that's slightly inconvenient and it's used so often in everyday life that we might as well just shrug the shrug and then uh, just let it be. So, uh, salts or ionic compounds are made of cations which are positively charged and anions which are negatively charged. They are overall neutral. This may mean you need per formula unit of salt multiple of each ion. But the overall charge has to be neutral otherwise this compound cannot hold together because having a blob that's made of all positively charged subunits or overall positively charged subunits is a great way for it to fly apart due to electric repulsion, well, electrostatic repulsion. Now these ions may be polyatomic, so they could be molecules that have become charged. Or they could just be ions that are single atoms, which we do not have a more specific term for. After all, polyatomic ions is already making a distinction that they are polyatomic. Okay, a weak chemical bond. Uh, well, there's a few flavors of these. Hydrogen bonds are between partially positive hydrogens and partially negative atoms, which are generally nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine, so really electronegative ones that tend to pull electrons in covalent bonds towards themselves. And van der Waals interactions, while rather less conspicuously important to biology compared to hydrogen bonds, which are found in, say, DNA, Van der Waals interactions may include hydrogen bonds if you're in an area that uses it as a catch-all term for weak intermolecular interactions or weak chemical bonds. Now, this term always includes London dispersion forces. In some places, like where I live, uh, it's used interchangeably with London dispersion forces. What are London dispersion forces? Well, let's say we have two electron clouds. clouds. Okay. Suddenly, one of them randomly has the electrons mostly concentrated on one side. Okay. What's the other one going to do? Well, if the electrons are, say, all concentrated over on the side of my fingers, uh, this one is going to notice that this is going to be a positive pole, and its electrons will tend to migrate so that it matches up, so that they are attracted to the positive charge, partial positive.
Oh, now we have a partial negative attracted to a partial positive, so they are drawn to each other. Neutral substances can attract each other by this means. So a spontaneous dipole, dipole means that there are two poles, a positive and a negative pole, induces another spontaneous dipole, and this creates a weak attraction. Now, the by forces, which are between permanent and induced dipoles, uh, such as you rubbing a stick of plastic or a balloon on your hair and then using it to pull up little pieces of paper, that's permanent and induced dipoles interacting. The by forces and Keesom forces may or may not be included in Van der Waals forces, depending on regional convention. However, London dispersion forces are always included. So in many places, what we use instead is dipole, dipole. Electrostatic. And London dispersion. London dispersion. Or just dispersion forces. Yeah, so where I come from, we don't use the term Van der Waals force that much. Individually, Van der Waals forces, all these interactions, are pretty weak. Uh, by the way, dipole dipole also includes hydrogen bonds. So pretty weak is a bit of a sketchy term given that DNA is actually held together pretty well. So diesel fuel remains liquid because of these weak forces. Uh, in the case of diesel fuel, there are long hydrocarbon chains. And that's going to be London dispersion, where you have spontaneous dipoles or spontaneous local dipoles inducing other spontaneous dipoles. Uh, Van der Waals forces also allow, say, geckos to climb up walls. And, well, London dispersion forces also allow spiders to climb up walls. Actually, the by forces, which are between permanent and induced dipoles, are also involved. Why? Hmm. Well, on those little hairs on the legs of spiders and geckos, or on the feet of geckos, those little hairs, uh, guys, proteins have permanent dipoles all over the place. So, or permanent localized charge all over the place, which means yeah, you're probably actually looking more at Debye force than London dispersion for a lot of cases, especially larger creatures like, well, hmm. Hans, get the Flammenwaffe. Yeah, no. So, well, I for one am not planning to take any vacations in Australia lately. Uh, anyhow, <coughs> molecular shape and function. Molecules have very specific shapes that are critical to their function. In other words, stop trying to ram a square peg into a round hole. Well, actually, you can do that if the round hole is bigger, but then it comes out too uh, easily, which is not exactly what you want if you want these two things to bond to each other for long enough for a reaction to actually happen. So, molecules, sure, you can have parts that flail about, such as in this morphine molecule, this ball and stick model. There's going to be some gyration, so some parts will move about with respect to other parts. And in a protein, for example, you can have two chunks that are connected by essentially a bridging element. So a single chain of atoms. Okay. Uh, yeah, obviously that's going to flail about, but when it comes together in a specific form, it can do something interesting. It can form bonds in particular ways.
Now, the specific structure will allow it to form weak and temporary bonds with other molecules by fitting closely enough to interact. Weak and temporary are relative terms compared to, say, covalent or ionic bonds. The aromatic ring on the lower left of this morphine molecule, you can notice that each of these carbons seems to only have three bonds. But the, this dashed line in here shows that there is a delocalized set of bonds, pi bonds, over this entire ring. So instead of two atoms being bonded together by a pi bond and two atoms and another two atoms, or the other pattern, you have bonds that seem to be intermediate in strength and length compared to single and double bonds. Now this morphine molecule, this aromatic ring area, oh I should move down a little, this part fits into endorphin receptors on brain cells, neurons. So, that is how it induces the same effect as natural endorphins. People were trying to work out why we would have receptors for morphine, which is not something that naturally is produced by the human body, for a while until we discovered natural endorphins in 1975. Even though we had long since figured that there must be something similar to morphine in our bodies. After all, runners high and other such conditions which dull aches and pains have been known for, well, since prehistory. So, uh, orbitals can hybridize. Okay. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, all right, uh, methane, ammonia, and water have sp3 hybridization. This means you end up with a tetrahedral structure like this. And one that sticks out and one that goes back. Going back is shown like this. Sticking out in front is shown like this. Technically, these two uh, we actually showed the lobes instead of sticking out and going back. If you wanted to show all the lobes, it would look potentially kind of confusing when you render it in uh, two dimensions. Hence why we showed this. By the way, this is flipped compared to that one. So, lone pairs will tend to push the bonds away because a lone pair has two electrons stuck in the hybrid orbital without being able to move toward the other atom significantly. So lone pairs will tend to repel bonding pairs rather harder than bonding pairs, repel bonding pairs. That the result is that while mathematically this should be 109.5 degrees between each set, so all of these angles should be 109.5 degrees. If it's hard to visualize like this, use your hand. Sure, it's kind of hard to make one of your fingers actually go backward, but you can just substitute. Okay? So, a tetrahedral formation should have 109.5 degrees. However, in ammonia we observe 107 degrees instead of methane's perfect 109.5 because of the lone pair pushing the bonding pairs away, i.e. closer to each other. So if this lone pair is shoving the others away, then they get pressed closer together. And in water, you have two lone pairs and pushes the angle down to 104.5 degrees. The tetrahedral bonding of carbon is common in organic molecules. Organic chemistry is basically the chemistry of carbon as far as we understand so far. 
because Earth life is carbon based. But you can also see things such as trigonal planar bonding in a peptide bond or carboxylic acid, in which case, well, instead of tetrahedral like this, except with another group sticking up, you have a flat conformation. And then you have a pi bond from a unhybridized p orbital sticking out of and into the page. This would be sp2 hybridization. We commonly see it in, for example, carboxylic acid. In this case, I just drew acetic acid. We also see this in peptide bonds where carboxylic acids react with amine on, well, the other end of another amino acid. And, well, that gives you an, and there's an H here, and so on. Now, either end, as uh, we have R, so remainder, something else. Now let's consider a few problems. What's the formula for ammonium sulfate? Well, uh, ammonium ion we know is NH4+, plus, and sulfate ion we should remember from lower grade chemistry classes is SO42 minus. Sulfate is, and ammonia are both very important to life because sulfur is a critical substance and so is nitrogen. So how do we balance the charges? Well we would need two ammonium to balance out one sulfate which leaves us with this formula. Okay, now let's say we're researching antibacterial drugs. Now why would we be interested in the three-dimensional shapes of natural signaling molecules? Well, there's an, a saying, idiom, or whatever you call it, garbage in, garbage out. Giggle is the abbreviation. Okay, so let's say the bacteria are getting garbage information about their environment. After all, bacterial colonies do communicate among members of a species and even among species. Well, then they're going to make the wrong response to the environment if they're getting bad information. So, garbage in, garbage out. out. Bad info can be fed to the bacteria. Fed to the bacteria. Uh, what else? Hmm. Well, what happens if the natural signaling molecule in question happens to interfere with our own signaling molecules or the signaling molecules of whatever organism the bacteria infects that we perhaps either want to kill or want to help. To the bacteria or organisms the bacteria interacts with such as Well, let's say we have a bacterial species that infects uh, mosquitoes, which spreads, say, malaria. Hmm. Well, if we want to control malaria, we have to control the mosquitoes, and we can promote this by getting the bacteria which might be secreting signals that interfere with the mosquito's immune response. Huh. We can interfere with that immune response even more. Let's try this. Interact. 
with. Uh, alternatively, if the bacteria messes with us, we might want to prevent it from messing with us, in which case want to block the bacteria's use of use of Gigo. So this is why we want to know the natural signaling molecules three-dimensional shapes to prevent miscommunication when we want to prevent such or to induce it when we want miscommunication. This is if we're researching antibacterial drugs or antifungal or whatever. What else? Well, we also want to prevent collateral damage. Now, avoiding collateral damage from interfering with signaling cascades or signaling chains, signal transduction systems, etc. Wording may vary. Uh, so, avoiding interacting badly with natural signaling when it's not intended is rather important. For example, uh, thalidomide was responsible for a lot of very terrible birth defects because one isomer of it suppressed limb bud formation in fetuses or embryos. The other isomer was effective against morning sickness. Unfortunately, the two isomers interconverted naturally, which means that thalidomide unintentionally resulted in interference with development. And sure, it wasn't an antibacterial drug to begin with, but if we have another antibacterial drug that similarly messes with development or other signal systems in an organism, that is not good. Which means that it's a good idea to be familiar with the natural signaling molecules and their three-dimensional shapes before we decide, hey, let's use this drug. Of course, usually the problems are actually found by just testing. And modern day testing is much more comprehensive than it was back when thalidomide was uh, fielded. And actually there is speculation on using thalidomide again as an anti-cancer drug. But that's another story and we can discuss that at some other time. For now, that's it for this section. So, see you later.